And thank you especially for all the hard work that everybody put into the future of this center and to making my stay here so comfortable and productive. Um, and now I'm going to deconstruct everything Helmut just said about this forest. <laughs> so uh, he threw out there some great terms, you know, pristine forest. He presents it as a national park. And that's probably because, you know, I mentioned something about that. But today's talk is about uh, who do you trust regarding the ontology of the forest? Is this forest really Europe's last primeval forest? If you type that into Google, the name of this forest, Biaul Vieja, will show up. Um, or is it a well-managed, sustainable commercial forest? Um, forests often cover large areas, we know, and they include mosaics of different types of tree stands, different uses, histories of logging, uh, protection, but we do abbreviate them as holes, um, as Helmut just did, and as I often do, too. Um, it's hard not to do that. I want to tell you, um, so here are some images of that forest, pristine, Primeval nature, uh, logged commercial forest, different compositions of plants and animals. So I'm a cultural anthropologist, and my main method of uh, finding out what I know is through a method called deep hanging out, otherwise known as participant observation. And that means I spend a lot of time not just interviewing other people, but living in this place for a long time. Uh, the first time I went there, as Helmut mentioned, um, through my connections with the US Forest Service where I worked, was in 2005, and that was just as a young person traveling freely, becoming interested in projects, and then I went on to do master's thesis research and doctoral research um, in this place. And, um, I talked with scientists and local people and forestry workers and farmers and tourists and everyone. And what I'm doing here at the Carson Center is writing a book about the way the communist and peasant past trouble conservation politics. And whoever chose this date for me to speak I think is very interesting because as you all know, uh, Poland yesterday just celebrated um, 25 years since the first free elections in Poland. Ob Obama was there visiting and also the purpose for Obama's visit is kind of in touch with these ideas that remain about Eastern Europe and Western Europe and what is a normal functioning democracy and what is the geopolitical role of the West versus Russia and these will kind of come up in my talk again. Um, and I want to make it clear that I'm repeating a lot of discourses that other people use um, and we can talk about that in the question and answer session. Um, but there's still a lot of orientalizing that goes on between East and Western Europe and a lot of talk about what gets counted as normal. Um, so this case that I'm talking about today is bringing the cultural boundaries of science into conversation with environmental history and post-socialist studies. This is a case where the locals are not just rejecting science, they're saying that they understand science better than the biologists. Um, so scientific practices here are refracting these notions of East and West, uh, universal, local, popular culture, scientific culture. And these discourses are what's producing this forest. And it's in the remaking due to post-socialist, what we might call post-communist contestations over legitimacy and expertise. So the piece of analysis I give you today is based on field research that took place between 1995 and 2007. But many of the things I talk about are still salient. But you have to understand over a period of 25 years, people are talking differently about the communist past from time to time. And people's lives have changed dramatically. So a few uh, facts about the forest. Um, it's 150,000 acres. As Helmut said, it's the last original home of the free roaming bison went extinct in the wild um, um, 1919 but then was reintroduced here and is now being reintroduced all over Europe including Germany, Romania, Denmark. Um, there are uh, old oaks, ash, line beam horn linden in this forest um, and also uh, stands that look a lot like that planted uh, pine stands. Um, so this forest exists, as Helmut said, on the border between Poland and Belarus. Um, and 
I worked only on the Polish side of the border. So on Belarus, the whole side is a national park. I'm not going to go into that right now, the details. But in Poland, you have a national park right here. Uh, this area is a strictly protected part of the national park. This area was added in 1996. And the rest of this forest is a commercially logged forest with a number of little reserves within it. Those are considered stands of old growth, so where the average age of the tree stands is more than 100 years old. Um, so that's 20% is a national park, 80% is a commercially logged forest. And there have been many accusations of overlogging and mismanagement in the last 20 years. So I have two mirroring, two mirroring complications I want to discuss today. The first is the question of who can gain legitimacy as a scientist at the local level. And the second is the question of who is local. Um, who can legitimately say what kind of forest this is? Is it a primeval old growth forest or a well-managed model of sustainable forestry? And one could argue that it is both or neither. Um, but I'm interested in the material discursive practices of people on the ground. Who gets to project what kind of forest it is and in what scales are they legitimated? So I'm saying that you can't do this kind of science technology stuff unless you have environmental history and I would say post-socialist studies here. Let me give you a very brief history of this forest. Uh, why is it considered you know, this last remnant of primeval forest? Because it's been protected by Polish and Lithuanian kings um, as a hunting ground, when Poland was partitioned by the Russian czars, uh, they continued uh, the protection. Of course, there are some uh, subtleties about what was logged, potash used. I mean, it was, certainly wasn't without use. Um, when it became Russia, uh, the area was Russified, meaning the Polish Catholic Church was uh, destroyed, Orthodox churches were built. Um, it's not uh, commercially logged until uh, the Germans occupy the area in World War I. Uh, they set up logging on a very large industrial scale, including sawmills in the nearby, what becomes an industrial logging town of Hainufka. They're using uh, slave labor, uh, Jews, Poles, um, other inhabitants, um, and it's quite widespread. So uh, when Poland uh, pops up on the map of Europe again in 1921. Uh, there are a number of aristocratic Polish foresters who are very well organized. And they come back to this area um, claiming the whole place um, in the name of Polish state forestry with the ideal that they're going to uh, replant it, they're going to restore it, um, not to its former self, but for use um, in commercial forestry, scientific forestry. But at that time, um, one of the founders of the IUCN, Władysław Schaffer, is also there. And he is very moved by the unprecedented damage to this forest, sets up one of the first national parks in Poland. Um, very small area. But um, from that time on, there are contestations between scientists and foresters over how this area should be used and protected. Uh, the local population at that time um, in the 1920s is almost entirely uh, Orthodox in faith, Belarusian. Uh, there are Bolsheviks who are organizing in the sawmills in nearby Hainufka. There's a Belarusian Communist Party there that wants to destroy the new Polish state. Uh, these are tense ethnic times. So the Polish foresters are there. They'll import labor from other parts of Poland. Uh, Polish laborers because they don't trust the local population. Um, and um, Hermann Goering is there hunting in the interwar period. During World War II, he decides that the whole area will become his private hunting ground and protects it. Um, so this is, again, very brief history, lots of details to this. But in the communist period, uh, there's a sense, um, of course, um, <coughs> which the forest gets split in two. Um, part of it is, becomes Belarus, another part Poland. Uh, but there's a sense in which ethnic differences are to be put aside. Nobody's going to talk about who's Belarusian, who's Polish. The communists are about progress, about moving forward. Um, if you're Belarusian, you can move to the Soviet Union. Some people who felt they were Belarusian did. Um, but uh, 
most people just stayed in place. And you have this growing population of Polish laborers who continue to be imported throughout the 20th century uh, for the ever-expanding needs of state forestry. Um, and you also have in the Cold War era more and more scientific institutes that pop up there. And nature conservation is seen as something very apolitical during the communist period. Um, um, and that changes considerably uh, by 1989. So in 1989, uh, first free elections in Poland, there's a group of biologists there who are in their late 20s, early 30s, who are totally uh, charged by the moment. They've participated in underground solidarity activities uh, where they went to schools in Krakow and Warsaw, Poznan, Wrocław, and they are set to reform society. Um, but they also began with all of these discourses about how, how the area is still too uh, under the control of Russia, still too Russified, and it has to do with this orthodox population there that has this passive, uh, you know, Slavic mentality. Um, and they're set to change that. Um, so these biologists go about and they set up independent newspapers. Um, they, they work in their off hours. Besides just doing their research, they're trying to get local entrepreneurs to open shops so that the state doesn't have a monopoly on stop shops. There are all these ways in which they talk about how you need to build civil society through this privatization, through this kind of entrepreneurial projects. And they're very well organized. By 1996, um, they work at high levels to expand the Bielowieża National Park. They double it. And by 1998, they convince um, the central government to set up something called the Contract for the Bielowieża Forest, in which the central government um, together in an agreement with the local people says the whole area will become a national park by the year 2000. So the whole commercial forest. Well foresters um, who have been downsizing their organization considerably, I mean this is a state agency so like all state agencies they have to <laughs> cut two-thirds of their workforce. There's also a, a mechanization. There are all kinds of funds available so that um, people both in forestry and science can become more uh, productive, uh, use more technologies, become more Western in ways. Uh, but there's a sense in which foresters are like, this, this national park isn't going to be expanded. Uh, they mobilize a lot of people in the villages, um, including um, Belarusians and Poles, um, everybody who used to work for state forestry. And one of the things that's interesting about going back to the communist time in Poland is that Agriculture is never collectivized successfully in Poland. So you have all these really small farms of two and three hectares. Um, so what the, the local population looks like um, in 1989 is that almost everybody has some land. If you were one of the original Belarusian inhabitants, you might have two or three hectares. If you were a laborer who moved into the area, you might have um, one hectare or a small garden plot. But everybody's doing work in the woods or they're uh, working for state forestry, but Belarusians are still have not advanced to this kind of higher uh, status positions, um, even though there's lots of intermarriages. People in kind of intelligentsia positions are still ethnic Poles. Um, and at the time that this national park is set to expand over the whole forest, uh, foresters are latching on to this idea of a uh, local Belarusian identity is something that needs to be protected and promoted and so they go about doing that and they're organizing in very populist ways against scientists who want uh, the national park area to have a lot of downed woody debris. I mean who would have thought that downed woody debris, that means dead trees lying on the ground and snags um, for, would be kind of a center point or talking point about western normalcy in this eastern part of Poland, but it does. Um, and so the, this is a calendar from this year. Um, these are kind of ongoing debates, but uh, this is the kind of populist opposition mobilized by a forester kind of anti-park lobby that says, if you leave all this downed woody debris on the forest floor, what you're gonna get is bark beetle outbreaks. And I know this is a big topic in Germany and the Bavarian National Forest too. Um, and this 
I mean, insiders have told me this picture is not from the Bielvisia forest, it's from <laughs> another forest, who knows. But the opposition is saying, you know, this is what we want the forest to look like, it has bison, you have this Michelangelo, <laughs> classic beauty, <laughs> and here we have death and destruction if the whole area will become a national park. Um, So who's, who's going to win? Who's going to prove their point and are they going to use science to do so? Um, one of the theorists I draw upon is Thomas Guerin, who's written a lot about the uh, cultural boundaries of science, have, have, as have a lot of other STS scholars. Um, and for cultural anthropologists, this makes a lot of sense. I mean, in STS, you had people oftentimes studying exactly what scientists do to see how scientific controversies play out. Uh, but anthropologists and other people within the STS community say, like, let's see science as if on a map. Like, let's chart all of these actors and see how they're responding to what science is. Um, so. There is this, of course, hegemonic um, ideal in place. In Bielvisia, everything was being set in epistemes of normalcy. Um, and there's this idea of strong, independent Western institutions. Of course, this is still a dependency relationship where these Eastern <coughs> institutions need the dependence on the Western institutions to be independent themselves. Um, but this is with and against attachments to what are seen as like the Russian institutions, which often in the discourses it, within the scientific community get placed as communistic, backwards, so there's that, that split that gets talked about. Mm. So there is a perception in post-socialist Europe um, that the one-party rule of uh, communism, socialism, was nothing like the struggles for legitimacy in the West. And my uh, scientific colleagues working at the Mammal Research Institute in particular um, thought I could not understand this. Um, that, you know, trying to gain legitimacy in the post-communist situation was something that really lingers, um, well, that this communism was really lingering and festering. Um, and of course, this serves a certain political aim in Poland, the aim of the conservative right right now. Um, but in uh, the eastern borderlands where I was, uh, people were saying that this communist past is still here because of this Russified population, because of the border with Belarus, where you have one of Europe's last dictatorships, um, a guy, President Lukashenko, I think, who's now in his fourth or fifth term, and he wants to uh, reunite the Soviet Union. Um, so scientists were saying that everyone here is suffering from a psychological post-communist syndrome, meaning that it's just doomed to repeat itself, or uh, Poland is still Soviet. Uh, here in Bielvieja, the red web is all around. Solidarity just cannot win. Um, so, you might think this is a little confusing because I told you earlier in my history part that it was Polish foresters who moved to this eastern borderland in 1921 and they want to Polonize the area. But now, uh, in the post-communist period, you have ethnic Polish scientists who are saying that the local Belarusian population is somehow in cahoots with foresters who want to destroy the forest. And it's the foresters who want to say, we can encompass this kind of multicultural Belarusian identity. But of course, that's also in line with a lot of internationalizing discourses about um, local people having rights and being able to make decisions about conservation and the places in which they live. Mm. So foresters did not speak of their organization as communistic, but as transhistorical. They told me that they survived as an institution throughout various political changes, and they were always independent, they stressed. They proudly spoke of their organization as hierarchical, kind of an example in this picture here. Uh, kissing the flag, um, there's lots of kind of rituals and formalities that go on. But one of the great things that they did, they felt, was to advance the local people. 
um, and that they weren't um, concerned about you know the ethnic identity of local people that they were really willing to stand up for the for the underground or the the underdog mm, of course foresters were arguing for a long time that a forest with rotting woody debris and standing dead timber was not a healthy forest but a breeding ground for bark beetles and disease and so the scientists would say oh they don't understand biodiversity functioning an ecosystem in many cases their knowledge is from the 19th century um, so oftentimes um, local residents would tell me that scientists work was totally irrele irrelevant and here's a sketch from the 1970s that a local person did but it kind of circulates in the scientific community today and it shows these scientists kind of taking the temperature of some bison doo-doo and writing it all down and they would have these jokes like oh you know the scientist wants to know why he doesn't get wet when he stands under the pine tree or that scientist came here and tired out a beetle for 40 years and then wrote something about it and then he left um, so all of these projections that uh, scientists are not fitting in at the local level. Um, one of the foresters, a senior level forestry official, um, tried to connect Russian history with local people's rights in the present. He told me, local people have rights given to them directly by the czars. On what principle could we take those rights away from them? We could change the situation, but that would be communistic. In communist times, you could have created this national park, and no one would have disputed it. So, in Forrester's view, the local people need foresters to protect them from anti-democratic scientists and conservationists. But of course, also, they think the forest would die by bark beetle attacks if it weren't for them. Um, so, local residents, um, the, there was a lot of organizing around ethnic Belarusian identity in the 1990s. This was primarily in the nearby logging town of Hainufka and even the bigger city, maybe 60 kilometers from there, called Białystok. Um, and they wanted to s say that if you create this big national park, you will destroy the Belarusians' chances for a normal development in Europe. They'll be uh, stuck on a reservation like Indians, is what they always said. Um, and in the year 2000, right as the environmental minister was coming to Beauviasia to announce this big national park, and you have to remember that the local councils initially signed on to, they got millions of dollars to expand this national park. And that millions of dollars didn't go to every household, but it went to build schools, sewage treatment plants, uh, new heating systems for the village, uh, repair roads, I mean, all these kinds of development um, projects. Um, so, allegedly, foresters, um, in connection with local people, organized this big protest. And there were people bussed in from other villages. Um, and one wonders, you know, where do these buses come from? Uh, but the uh, local librarians told me that their bosses uh, required them to make these signs, which blame certain scientists in the village. They're saying these scientists are the cause of our poverty. The EU um, uh, Judas trader get out. Um, so they were very anti-EU. This wasn't even European Union yet, uh, but there were projections about uh, the scale that environmentalists were working at, and also about the loss of jobs. I mean, after 2000, this area had exponential tourist growth. I'm not going to talk about that much today, but there were all these linkings, linking with issues. And most of these signs are in Polish here, but there were also signs in Belarusian um, that said the same thing. Um, so what happened was uh, the environmental minister and everybody else totally backtracked. They said, oh, local people are against this. We can't have this big national park. Um, uh, we already gave the money away, but uh, we need to do something. And Foresters and uh, many local council members were writing a new law uh, that passed. It was called the Law on Nature Protection of 2001. And in the hearings about that law, people brought up this protest um, where they threw eggs at the environmental minister. 
And the law says you cannot expand or liquidate or create any new national park in Poland unless local people approve. So this was seen as a huge victory for the local. Um, and uh, mo local councils were mostly run by foresters or pro-forestry people. So biologists responded with discourses about meritocracy, blaming foresters for bribing officials at the highest levels of government, as evidenced by foresters granting the speaker of the same a cozy cottage deep in the forest where he could live and hunt with high-level foresters, archbishops, and mayors. They also said that foresters use heating wood to bribe at the local level. Thus, local people's understanding about the facticity of Bioviesia's nature, a primeval forest complex threatened by logging or well-managed commercial forest, was embroiled in the politics of the local and post-communism. So actors are often understood as constituencies with agendas. You have foresters, biologists here doing some genetic tests on uh, maybe wolf or bison. That's a big part of the Mammal Research Institute. Um, and we have uh, local people as an actor, too. Um, and we all know that uh, stories are much more complicated than just actors with their agendas. Um, and that's what I'm getting at in the book I'm writing at RCC. Um, but I think the discourses and large representative actions are really hard to get away with, or hard to get away from. Science appears to be what biologists do. Uh, forestry, of course, is the applied science of of forestry, um, but foresters, uh, they're invoking s science as a tool that's on their side rather than calling themselves scientists. So here in Bielviesia, there's no universal science against local interests. Um, and if we use an STS concept of the cultural boundaries of science, then popular media, the history of scientific forestry, and a diverse array of business interests complicate pure science. Uh, in one significant way, uh, biologists asserted their authoritative control, author their authoritative knowledge about the forest, which really marked the post-socialist era. In 1994, a predator-prey study group, um, these are permanent researchers living in the village, they acquired radio telemetry equipment. Um, these are instruments that uh, require biologists to capture and release animals. They use these flags to kind of direct them in the forest, and then they put a collar around them, and then they can trace them using these radio signals uh, day and night. Um, and this sparked an enormous amount of controversy at the local level. Of course, this was a modernization move on the part of biologists to symbolize their distance from the past and their seriousness about producing top-notch science that would make significant contributions at the international level. Um, by using telemetry, you can really see where animals are going. You can take blood samples to see how they're genetically related to wolves in Siberia, the Carpathians, even France. Um, you can know, how, you know, should we develop more corridors here to connect populations? And they would take this kind of information and publish it in top-notch journals. And of course, this, like any of us, gets you invites to conferences, workshops, opportunities at the Rachel Carson Center, whatever it is. Um, and now, during the communist period, um, unless you belonged to the party, you weren't even allowed to learn English. You weren't allowed to travel abroad. So you can imagine in the mid-1990s that this group of young scientists was very excited about this opportunity to become like serious international scientists and not have to belong to the party. Um, so locals, including my, my friend Mirek here, were telling me that these biologists were unnecessarily torturing animals for their international careers. And that these scientists, again scientists who live in the village, should be trying to fit into the village. Uh, foresters would reinforce this logic. Um, as I said, they were voted on to high positions at the local councils. Um, and they would participate in the gift economy at the local level. Um, one old woman I was visiting, uh, she said, oh, you visit a lot of people in the village. Could you bring me some freshly made butter? And I said, oh, I bet I could, but you know, your, your son is a forester. He knows all those people on the northern side of the forest. He could bring you some butter. And she said, oh, if I asked my son to bring me butter, he would have to give away the whole forest. I mean, just sort of reinforcing this idea that 
it, the system really does work that way. That you know, you get a little more wood if you give somebody a little gift, and then there's a, a whole exchange expected in return. Um, so locals, biologists, they spent their whole careers in Bialvia Asia, and they raised their children there, but they were still not considered locals. Uh, foresters would be considered locals by many people's accounts. The, uh, one people, one family told me that the scientist is like a Jehovah's Witness. He comes here and tries to get us to change our faith, whereas the forester fits in. And they were comparing the forester to the auroch. Now the auroch is this ancient um, progenitor of the domestic cow that once was last seen in this forest, like the bison. This was its last holdout, um, but. It, that the forester was doing a kind of ecological work by uh, keeping the forest open through cutting and replanting. Um, one night, I was watching the Discovery Channel with uh, this family here, and uh, there was a program about the Serengeti, and the scientists were uh, radio collaring some animal there, and they were convinced that. Uh, people on the Discovery Channel, the scientists they saw, really knew how to treat these animals well, that they weren't torturing them, that it was really just a problem with the Polish scientists. Um, that they didn't, they were, you know, too new with the equipment, they didn't know what they were doing, they were misguided. So I ta started talking to more and more people, and people would come up to me in the shops or at the bus stops, and they knew that at that time, this was in 2005, I had an office at the Mammal Research Institute. And I think they, they didn't think that I knew what went on there. And they would say, oh, you know what those scientists are doing? Um, you know, they're torturing animals. And then they started to direct my attention to this videotape, which was made in 1999. And it was something that had, had actually aired on the Discovery Channel. Uh, and this is an episode made by a team of British eco-volunteers who show up in the forest. And it looks like they're going to volunteer with the Mammal Research Institute. Uh, but as the program unfolds, you realize, like, yes, the scientists really are cruel and unusual, and the, uh, the volunteers want to go to the site of the wolf capture and film it, but the scientists are like, no, 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 you can't do it. And so the film gets you to believe, like, oh, there's some kind of biological cover-up going on. Um, this is a picture from the film. I don't actually have it, but um, they have this kind of, they, the volunteers actually end up following the scientists to the capture site of the wolf and here are the scientists and they've got this blurry camera and they're shaking in holding down a wolf and they tell me supposedly the local people that this wolf is, is pregnant um, and then the film takes this very investigative journalistic approach and goes to visit foresters and a rival biologist who explain um, what radio telemetry does to these animals including uh, choking and killing them so there are some animal rights activists who become involved in this, and they don't really have a position on whether or not the park should expand or not, but they definitely want to see radio telemetry end, and they take these Polish biologists to court. Um, the biologists end up winning, and they explain to me all the details of how this animal was not killed by telemetry. You know, they can't believe that this gullible local population is, uh, you know, trying to get me to believe them. Um, and uh, anyway, they go to great lengths to interpret this. But what does it all mean that um, local people are trying to interpret what biologists and forests are doing to make credible facts about the forest where they live? Now, this has to be placed in the post-socialist context. Biologists pursue careers in forest protection simultaneously as a means to speak authoritatively to reform their society. Becoming a real scientist means participating in standardized practices shared by the international community of wildlife biologists. And unless they acquire and use certain technologies, they can't legitimately speak for the forest at the level of the international scientific community. And te technologies appear to give them an objective picture, one that evokes scientific authority over the body of the forest. And the more entrenched they become in pursuing their careers, I told you earlier that they were very involved in the politics of the local, that was in the 90s, but in the last 10 years, all they have time to do is publish papers, do their science, go to conferences. Um, 
But the more entrenched they become in these, pursuing these international careers, the farther they appear from being the local. And radio telemetry is not going to solve the problem of what is proper management or even what is good science. And yet the facts of the technology's interpretation and application at the local level speak volumes about which truth counts. So foresters, of course, are also using objectifying technologies to know their forest and their method derives from applied scientific forestry. Divide the forest up into a grid, uh, you know, think about board feet, how to maximize tree growth, soil type, what to plant where, moisture level regimes, and they love to talk in scientific terms about the forest. Now local people know the forest in ways that don't involve sophisticated technology. Um, Historically, um, until very recently, they've collected a lot of mushrooms and berries and antlers. Um, those are fading practices as more and more people become involved in a booming tourist economy. Um, and they're not forced by work to go to the forest so much anymore. And they heat their wood more with biofuels than um, wood. Uh, but it's interesting that the way they get to know this forest is through watching a television program. And this Dances with Wolves episode, which circulated widely, as I said, hand-to-hand -hand on a video cassette, um, suggests the importance to them of a valid source of Western knowledge about their local Polish scientists. So Greg Mittman and Donna Haraway might help us um, interpret some of this, because I think they've done a great job showing how nature films have long been complicit in creating illusions of reality about nature and the scientists who study it. They're attracting large audiences and capturing the public imagination is at the core of what nature films do. They're supposed to give viewers direct, unmediated uh, contact with uh, and access to wildlife. And their authoritative appeal is their scientific veneer. In Bioviesia, local people spent less time in the forest and increasing time watching television. I know that's very much a trope of the post-socialist era, but I really think um, it's true in my experiences. And media created this new social relationship between people, but also about people in the forest where they live. So biologists blame this stupid uh, show that circulated on a few animal rights activists and a rival biologist. But given the history of truth in the communist era, secret police, etc., they were very committed to finding an episteme of science and democracy with which to operate. Um, science, as they understood it, as a detached form of inquiry for producing truth, had to belong on their side, they felt, and they were ready to police that boundary. Interesting, though, biologists never pointed out the Western nature of the uh, television production. Again, they just blamed locals for their russified, backward mentality and attachment to forestry's, foresters' power. Um, for the locals, I think the program provided evidence of what their biologists really do in the forest and what they can't see by going into the forest themselves because no one has ever seen foresters, or sorry, biologists doing these things to animals. Um, and locals watching this show believe that they were drawing upon international notions of good scientific practices, as with what they would tell me about watching the Discovery Channel or Animal Planet more generally, um, that they were versed in. Um, thinking about science. So local people used these discourses to reinforce an idea of belonging, foresters and themselves, deeply rooted in the natural history, while also showing their cosmopolitan new identities. Biologists persisted as viewing locals as provincial, misled by the resource logic of foresters. Thomas Guerin suggests that scientists compete for epistemic authority while ordinary people take shortcuts in understanding which science to believe. If we want to learn something about the way science works, the answers will be found not only by looking at the practices of scientists, but at which facts are trusted by people whose lives are affected. Thus, the local people, you will remember they have the power to decide whether or not this whole area will be a national park. They're particularly important in arbitrating facts about this forest. Uh, but local people do not just attempt to interpret scientific facts. If we take science to be a transcultural activity to which many actors contribute, local people contribute to the stabilization and overturning of facts. And I think they're caught up in a distinctly post-socialist set of relations with foresters and wildlife biologists. Uh, they're part of a vast network of institutions and infrastructures that link expertise to knowledge. Uh, 
They spread notions of what counts as good science and in doing so reinforce the idea that the Biao Vieja forest is a well-managed commercially logged forest. So neither biologists nor foresters are saying their evidence points to whether the forest is truly primeval or truly well managed. But what they are trying to do with their way of knowing the forest, they're sending a message that says, listen to us, to our potential for knowing this forest based on our commitment to knowing truth in our respective ways. And they point to their established legitimacy as reasons that people should trust their knowledge rather than arguing about the particular biological details of their studies. So local people embrace the idea that they can decide for themselves who is a legitimate scientist, what should be done with the forest. They often accuse biologists of being pseudo-ecologists. But they don't use this measure to grant epistemic authority over the forest. Local people are applying standards of belonging. Um, and about socialist era notions of the state providing them with jobs and security. I mean, one of the reasons they're still so nostalgic about this era when state forestry was so powerful. Um, and I think they believe they're capable of understanding complex scientific practices. Credibility contests over what science is doing are rarely won by science alone, as well as we all know with so many other cases, because science is a cultural activity. Once we're able to see how science and scientists are embroiled in social worlds, we also see how their claims are subject to local social rules for belonging and acceptability. And I think what is interesting about this case for STS in environmental history is that um, credibility is caught up in an era. In this case, it's a post-socialist era in which people are always still striving for this ideal of normalcy. And are they going to use the imagined West for that ideal? or you know, this imagined Russia, which in many ways is, is not an imaginary, but um, includes uh, epistemic practices. Um, so local actors, both scientists and locals, refer to Western normalcy as an un unobtainable yet achievable goal. And such historical stickiness binds the forest of the history with credibility contests for what nature is and the best way to use and protect it. Thank you. <laughs>